Good morning, everyone. Still on track here, and uh, it's always funny. I bring notes up, but then I get going and get actually look at the notes there. So <laughs> let's make sure I stay on track here. So good morning, glad to be here. Um, we'll be talking today about uh, some of our efforts over in knowing some of our experiences with the ecological forecasting roadmap. Uh, essentially, the roadmap provided a construct for us across NOAA to start working on it across the uh, line offices, as well as to engage or make engagement with the public uh, and our partners, uh, one of the primary uh, methods for getting after both the forecast development uh, and actual sending that forecast, that's disseminating that forecast uh, out to the public here. So, what I just thought I wanted to do uh, is number one, uh, provide some insight into some of these specific type of forecast activities we do, uh, and then focus on some of the lessons we've learned uh, about partnerships and stakeholder engagement. And I like the discussion that's been going on this week about what is the definition of a partner. Uh, my boss, Steve Thur, uh, program office director for Incall, so I always like his analogy because he'd say, you know, with partnership, um, if we dig back over the kids, if we want to build that Lincoln Law house in a partnership, you bring your Lincoln logs, I got my Lincoln logs, and we all collect them and we build the house. Um, that's an important piece. Other times, it's not necessarily that dynamic. It's, uh, hey, you'll bring your Lincoln logs over to my house. If I give you some M&Ms, and they better be two packs that you need not m and right? Uh, and, then, and then you'll come bring your Lincoln logs and we can all play together. And that's not to downplay that. It plays an important role. Uh, and we have both of those dynamics going with the ecological forecasting over in NOAA here. So, because I see this week as sort of a kickoff in building relationships there, not to, not to say I'm the show here, the science is the big show, but I did want to give a little bit more introduction of myself. So, um, we've been talking about the interdisciplinary approach to ecological forecasting all week. So, originally, I actually came into NOAA as a molecular biologist, applying that work to fish health. And we would go out, most of our work was in Chesapeake Bay, work with Spire Bass. Uh, we used fish health as a surrogate for environmental health. And did a lot of land use, uh, in a little, did a lot of studies looking at land use impacts on the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, did that for, well, I'd say about seven years at Council Graduate School and as a professional before coming here to DC and working with the uh, uh, Program Coordination Office for NOAA. So actually, got a for Dr. Solomon and the health staff and the old administrator uh, during her time. Uh, and then finished that up and then transitioned into my current position as portfolio manager for the Eco Forecasting Roadmap. Uh, in that position, I have coordinated those cross uh, teams and also serve as a focal point for some of the external engagement as well for roadmap activities. I, I point that out uh, because really it is our scientists, our experts who have been working in this field for 10, 15, 20 years who are really driving uh, what we're doing with the roadmap. I'm here to help coordinate, but it's really those technical experts who are the, uh, the geniuses that are really putting together these forecasts. I'm glad to have several of my colleagues, uh, Chris Brown, Beth Turner, uh, here, in the, here in this meeting this week uh, to provide their insight as well. Lastly, I'll share a couple contact information, so feel free to uh, reach out to me anytime after uh, this week. So we've seen a couple similar graphs um, to this particular one this week, so I won't spend a lot of time, but when we look at forecasts within NOAA, uh, we're looking at uh, both that spatial extent of the forecast and the uh, temporal scale of our particular forecast. And we essentially spend, well, we spend a lot of time focusing on regional forecasts that provide actual intelligence within the scope of anywhere between days uh, up to seasons. But we also do more of the long-term long -term forecasting. If you saw Beth Turner's post, she talked about the scenario forecast. And we do uh, forecasts that are related to climate change as well. So we do span, uh, span a broad area of this time and space sort of dynamic here. But you're here we talk mostly today about that middle portion, the regional forecast uh, that span within days to seasons. Uh, so even forecasting in NOAA. Uh, we've talked about this some this week, and I'll, I'll, I'll uh, reaffirm this now, is that most of our work is applied research. We are looking to provide forecasts that provide actual intelligence, whether that's for managers, uh, whether it's for the general public. Uh, we find these specific target groups and provide them with the type of information that they can make 
key decisions on. And I appreciate some of the conversations we've had uh, here this week about uh, you know the time scale for those decisions and specifically targeting what decisions can be made prior to actually developing those forecasts. That's been an important lesson we've learned is the need to engage those stakeholders at the beginning so we can uh, discreetly define their needs and then to create the forecast from there. Uh, so most of our forecasts focus on people, economies, and communities. We have key legal mandates that drive our portfolio. Uh, for example, our market, our market is the legislation that uh, drives our research, monitoring, um, detection, and mitigation for harmful outflows, apps, uh, as well as hypoxia in the country there. So we're specifically within NOAA's National Ocean Service uh, and specifically within NCOS, National Center for Coastal Ocean Science, tasked with addressing our market and that drives a lot of the portfolio. And we have other legal mandates as well. Uh, we also focus on our administrative priorities. So from NOAA, blue economy is a big piece. Uh, by blue economy, I mean all those commercial activities that rely on the ocean and rely on the healthy ocean. Everything from fishing, um, agriculture, recreation and tourism, all those components that provide a vibrant coastal economy that are based on having a healthy ocean there. So you'll hear me talk a little bit about how our forecast, for example, help uh, promote aquaculture around the U.S. coast. And I mentioned earlier, again, in, in terms of space, we break down our forecast and how we engage with partners largely at a regional uh, scale. Say, for example, Great Lakes region or Gulf of Mexico region. Um, but even though we're looking at that regional scale, we want to have national significance. So when we look at uh, topics such as uh, all the outer blooms, we're essentially, no one is essentially doing work in every portion of the uh, U.S. coast that is impacted by all the outer blooms. But we do our engagement based on sort of that region specific. Uh, when I talk about some of the forecasts specific, uh, specifically, you'll see where different regions have different needs, uh, different applications. Even when you talk within a uh, single topic of all the outcomes there. So we definitely have to get in there and get more of a higher resolution view uh, for what those forecasting needs are based on the region. Um, I told you I was going to be looking at those here, so <laughs> let me make sure I'm referring back. Um, we developed the initial ecological forecasting roadmap. Um, to get more cross line office engagement on forecasting. So originally we had uh, a lot of our scientists from National Ocean Service doing the foundational research in ecology and outreach to stakeholders. But obviously we see from uh, conversations here this week, there is a definite need. You gotta be talking to those folks who do the IT infrastructure. Uh, you gotta have our folks who are developing ecological models linking in with those folks who have the operational models for, say, ocean circulation, so that you can couple those models up. And then you have to be able to talk to folks like the weather service who have uh, all that experience in uh, both uh, creating forecasts and disseminating and communicating that information out appropriately uh, to the public there. So there's a lot to be learned when we come together as one another to develop um, uh, these efforts. And so for us, uh, the original roadmap was created in 2015. Uh, the timeline for that roadmap was up to 19, and so I'll talk about it in a second. We're at a pivotal point here where we're redefining that roadmap moving forward. Uh, so right now, our technical areas are with all our blooms has hypoxia, uh, pathogens is a big piece. Uh, pathogens, by pathogens, we mean mostly work with vibrio uh, species, uh, bacteria that are uh, present in the water and they end up, in, in fact, or end up um, being concentrated in oysters. Uh, in shellfish, and so we uh, predict the presence of pathogens to help support ocean aquaculture and protect public health as well. Uh, and we also do a lot of work with habitat. And uh, uh, again, it's all best folks for uh, last night, uh, a lot of scenario based. So we're looking at things like uh, impacts of climate change on fisheries habitat, how are fish going to move according to climate scenarios uh, on the uh, Atlantic coast, or how fish downscaling some of the Global climate models for Chesapeake Bay to see how past steps are change in Chesapeake Bay based off of uh, climate, changing climate. Uh, we're organized on that forward charts and everyone. I'll just say we're organized briefly. Our, each of our focal areas 
have technical teams, those across those teams that engage specifically on those projects within uh, that area. Uh, and then I serve in the middle here as the portfolio manager to help coordinate those things, bring uh, uh, each of those uh, each of those things as action co leads on them. Uh, and then we have the executive steering committee, which is our big bosses, the SDSers uh, from across the line offices that really help draw uh, a lot of the larger decisions uh, and help promote uh, what we're doing in eco forecasting to, uh, to higher levels of the level. Ecological forecast for us is highly interdisciplinary. Uh, I used to have an example here in this uh, set of figures here. So we have those folks that are doing the foundation of ecology. And we actually work closely uh, with a lot of academic partners to do much of that foundational research. So, so perhaps we have to know, of course, what environmental factors uh, promote uh, formation of blooms and how they move. And so we have those folks that are doing work in a lab in the field to, uh, to address uh, those questions. Uh, we also work with a lot of folks that do sensor technology and engineering to be able to deploy things like our environmental sample processors, uh, what we call a lab in the can, to be able to go out and get real time observations uh, in the ocean that help us forecast for things like that. Uh, satellite data is a heavy piece, especially for apps. So we need those people who uh, understand how to pull satellite data, create those algorithms, create those models to tell us. Um, how blooms are forming and where they're going based off of that satellite data. Uh, and then, of course, we need those computational people, uh, those uh, applied mathematics, uh, those computer scientists and uh, GIS experts there that can provide uh, much, much of the uh, mapping and sort of uh, physical product, uh, uh, production of products that actually communicate uh, all volumes. Where are apps going to go? Where are these hypoxic areas going to be? Where are the fish moving based on our forecast information? And so, as I mentioned, um, our portfolio does vary uh, by time and space, and the service delivery mechanism uh, does vary based on stakeholder need. And in some cases, if you go to uh, the Great Lakes, uh, and down in uh, Florida, as you saw the uh, red tide this summer that uh, was all over CNN and all over the news. Um, in those cases, we provide actual uh, uh, bulletins, fully formed bulletin, and I'll show an example here in a second, uh, at a set time to managers. Uh, so we're taking that data, we're developing those models, we have those observations, and we put together a formalized bulletin for those managers and, uh, as our service delivery mechanism. In other cases, uh, we might have a web-based mechanism that we're serving out uh, those visual model visualizations uh, and some of the data to the correct uh, uh, to the correct use of groups. Uh, the model skill in our comfort with uh, uncertainty also varies according to stakeholder input and the user groups input and needs. Okay, so one thing we recognize uh, is that, for example, your weather forecast needs to be spot on. Uh, I think I was mentioning this in one of the groups uh, yesterday. Uh, weather forecast needs to be spot on. Okay. We had, I still remember this past winter, uh, one of the snowstorms came in and dumped on us a little bit there. Forecast that originally said it was going to be that bad, and all man, those guys caught it. They were getting calls from everybody from congressionals to their average shows that were uh, pretty concerned because that forecast was off. For ecological forecast, we recognize because of that variable uh, need and the type of decisions that are being made, uh, they're not necessarily as stringent as um, some of the user needs for weather forecasts there. And so we have that variable um, uh, sort of a level of uncertainty that we're comfortable with, especially considering how cutting edge many of those forecast activities are. Um, so keep that in mind as well. Um, and just where we're at now is uh, updating that new strategic plan. We're talking about specifically what should be on in that eco forecasting portfolio. We want to take advantage of you know changing administrative priorities, uh, updates to technology and capabilities, uh, and some of the lessons we've learned about how best to engage with partners and define what their needs are. Uh, and a big piece here is the increased use of social science from start to finish for our efforts. So we want to make sure we're using um, established social science tools. To help us engage at the forefront, whether it's uh, with our partners and stakeholders, as well as what we've talked about some this week, which is having um, 
uh, the research and design of the models, not just be an ecology problem, but talking specifically with our uh, IT infrastructure, computational modeling folks at the core of the developing forecast more in lockstep to help uh, increase that efficiency of our research to operations or applications pipeline. Uh, and we want to make sure we're using social science to do get value, do value information studies. Okay, so we mentioned having a, uh, we're investing the funds to do a forecast. Those forecasts are helping to inform key decisions. Well, what's the value of a user group having that information and perhaps changing their behavior according to the forecast? That's an important piece when we think about uh, uh, not only just not putting it all economic coverage, but got return on investment, uh, as well as defining how well we're actually serving those user needs. Okay, so with partnerships, the big thing here, uh, partnerships, again, both the idea of us working collaboratively, collaboratively as well as uh, in those instances where you might be paying for services or a key. Um, I'm going to use a couple of examples of partnerships, primarily focused on the IUS regional associations, because they are huge partners in driving what we do for ecological forecasting. So IUS is the Integrated Ocean Observing System, um, they are regionally based partners. Uh, the regional associations are regionally based partnerships. Uh, so I, the IUS home is in Mello. Uh, so we have an actual program office for IUS. And then IUS works directly with the regional associations. Uh, those regional associations are a consortia of academic partners, state, local entities, uh, even in some cases private sector entities who focus specifically on uh, adding these networks of ocean observations uh, for each of these regions. And you'll see they're pretty, uh, got pretty great coverage throughout the U.S. Okay, Those are folks that are doing ocean observations, um, data management, data stewardship, serving data out. And the people side is huge. They are quite familiar with those regional networks, mad state shellfish managers, fisheries managers, um, uh, uh, the folks who issue uh, are, are, are managing local beaches, and uh, so they provide NOAA with an entryway uh, so that we're not just relying on our network, we got those local folks there that can help uh, drive our science and connect us to partners there. They've been absolutely pivotal, pivotal uh, in many, uh, let's, say most, let's say it's just say most of our forecast activities. Thank you, Douglas. He's shaking there. Um, and so when we think about that key partnership there, a couple of uh, instances where uh, I want to provide a couple of examples of where we've really seen a lot of value. Um, if we look at observations and our evolving capabilities, um, I mentioned this a moment ago, we have uh, out down in Florida. Index, uh, the state of Florida as well as Gulf Coast in Texas, uh, when a red tide comes, it releases toxins, those toxins can kill uh, everything from marine mammals to fish. You saw, like we saw on the news, you saw all those piles of fish up on the beach there. So the folks who have that key interest in going down to Florida and, and being there part of the fishing communities, um, that's not too good of a thing, right? It, it, you see, you catch more stuff on the beach. The other piece there is those toxins get aerosolized uh, and cause a lot of respiratory problems. Uh, it, it, has anybody experienced that? Been down to those beaches and experienced it? Yeah. Cause respiratory problems, especially if, uh, if someone is asthmatic or, or immunocompromised there. Uh, so that's huge impacts for tourism. Um, down to the point that, you know, if you're the local uh, restaurant here um, and you, you got that beach front piece of property and this bloom washes up and you're having aerosolized toxins, then people are going to sit outside and go to your restaurant, right? Uh, so those folks down in Florida, you got key stakeholders that need to know um, hey, when's the bloom coming? What are the chances on that? Some respiratory impacts there. Uh, and that's why we provide a forecast specifically for uh, Gulf Mexico with a uh, focus on Florida here. In this case, uh, the service delivery model is to provide a bulletin. The bulletin is created from looking at uh, satellite imagery, seeing where the bloom is and where it may be going uh, within the Gulf. Uh, we incorporate uh, ocean circulation models into that mix, uh, a lot of foundational information about the ecology of halves and how they grow and how they move. And then we work with uh, our, our partners, uh, our internal partners, uh, co-op center of operational oceanographic products and services uh, to help create these bulletins. So what you see here is for the counties, 
We're providing these respiratory uh, warnings for the likelihood that there will be impacts from hags. We also work with our partners in the, so this bulletin goes out on a listserv to key managers. Thank you. Uh, it goes out on that listserv, and then uh, we also work with the weather service that disseminates a beach hazard forecast out to the public there, uh, which has worked great. This has been in operation since uh, about 2004. Uh, but we're growing, we're advancing, and in working with, uh, uh, in this, this case, it was GCOOS, uh, the Gulf uh, Integrate, uh, the Gulf uh, uh, Regional Association, uh, working with those guys and our uh, National Half Monitoring Network. Uh, we've advanced some of the technology to where now we have this app scope, cell phone based, taking pictures and observations locally uh, using easy to use technology. That we can engage with our citizen science scientists with. Uh, those connections are made through that High East Regional Association. And now we can get down to a much more uh, higher spatial resolution for our forecast activity. So if you see here, uh, for each county, each that broad swath of county uh, gets a warning. Uh, but apps or those blooms are patchy. So if you're at one beach, you can eat, you can go, you can travel down the road five miles and not necessarily be in that blue patch. This type of technology, leveraging the uh, partnership with the regional associations and our community, uh, our citizen scientists, are allowing us to provide a much higher resolution forecast for the area. That's all five minutes, so I got to speed through here. Uh, stakeholder engagement, again, through the IH regional associations is helping us improve other forecasts as well. In this case, our half forecast for Gulf of Maine. Uh, those again, red tide, those toxins come in, they impact shellfish beds, and then they, uh, if you as a human go out to pursue those shellfish, you're going to get sick. Uh, so there's those states, uh, Maine, New Hampshire, others, they routinely monitor uh, those shellfish beds for closures. So we've had uh, the experimental forecast that's uh, providing information uh, both on a seasonal basis and on a, uh, we're at, providing a regular bulletin. We did some further engagement with stakeholders and working with that regional association to pull in the appropriate partners and gain that stakeholder input uh, so that now we have a much more improved product delivery system uh, with the new dashboard that's going out now. Uh, I'm showing this to you today, but you see I'm slightly experimental on this. This is in uh, transition and operations. But engagement with stakeholders, in this case, Provided us a better mechanism for serving up the information and serving up the information that they actually needed. That uh, web layout you saw on that chip wasn't necessarily geared for them, wasn't necessarily the best thing for their needs. They needed something that provided them more, um, more uh, in, a, in a more uh, concentrated space, the type of information they could use to go out and then make decisions about where they might need to sample, um, where hat doctors are coming, and where what shellfish beds might be impacted. One of the challenges we have is with uh, transitioning research uh, into operations. Uh, I use the Pacific Northwest Half Bulletin as an example. So Oregon and Washington uh, both impacted with had all power balloons and their associated toxins and low acid. Uh, and in this case, they have these local uh, communities there on the coast where razor plant digging is huge. People come all around the state. Uh, it supports a lot of uh, tourism to these small towns, both in hotels, restaurant stays, folks coming to dig these places. It's a big deal out there. Uh, so they, of course, want to know when that bloom is coming, and then those state managers can offset uh, the timing of the harvest window so that they beat the bloom before it comes, or augment so later so that the impacts of that bloom are gone. And we, in this case, it's an interpretive bulletin. Instead of being a statistical model, it's an interpretive bulletin that goes out to those state managers. Well, the issue we've had with transitioning this product, which is, um, uh, has, has received great reviews from those <coughs> groups, uh, is the fact that we have to make sure that um, in working with all our partners, in this case, partners who bring their labor laws, uh, we address those possible single points of failure. So this bulletin is created not just by NOAA doing observations, but the state funds observations, some of the tribal communities uh, fund observations uh, that all go into the system. And actually, the interpretation uh, of this information is done at the university. So we have a diversity of partners supporting this system. Um, but in this case, say the university uh, partner, 
is a single faculty member say, say if he leaves. Or no problem. We have to make sure there's no problem continues if we lose that single point. Um, or in our case, we have key observations that come from ships on no vessels. We all know vessels cost money. Uh, so in order to make this uh, operational problem in the long term, we've got to make sure that we can invest all the actual uh, invest in those actual ships or some other capabilities uh, to do uh, the forecast. Uh, so I'm not going to stop time here, so I'll just leave it at this. Couple of engagement points there. I do organize the, uh, our email forecast for about 17 meetings. Um, we love for special topics that get generated out of this group. It'd be a great opportunity to see Mike and others how we might be able to incorporate some of these discussions into our meetings. Uh, we will be at ESA. Uh, I want to highlight some of the funding opportunities that I have to assist. And these are funding opportunities available to the academic community. Uh, and actually, I will stop right there. So these links will be available. I'll make sure that you have links so that we need to come back, you're able to access those. So check us out and thank you.